Hello, welcome friends. Uh, I'm Nicole, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm one of the producers of today's sessions, along with my colleagues. Hi, I'm Hannah Fenlin, she, her, hers. Hey, Anne-Marie Lonsdale, she, her, hers. Abigail Vega, she, her, hers. Today, we are so excited to have with us the artists who have been building community and creating art with intentionality across boundaries that are geographic and socially um, created. We're going to be in conversation with Rachel Spencer, Spencer Hewitt, Claudia Alec, Ashley Hansen, Cole Alvis, and Ty Defoe. All of them are doing exciting work and we'll hear more about that soon. This is the fourth in our series of online events. As you might have heard last week, we are committed to a practice of community tithing, where we work to extend 10% of our cash resources to other collectives and organizations providing relief with a focus on serving the most vulnerable populations of freelance artists. We will be paying our speakers today, as well as commit to a tithe towards an organization doing this important work. This week, we are contributing to the, to the American Indian Community House in New York City. AICH is a nonprofit organization serving the needs of Native Americans residing in New York City. To learn more about them, follow HowlRound on Twitter at HowlRound, H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D. They just tweeted out this website and they'll also be tweeting out other relevant links as this conversation continues. So if you get something out of today's conversation, add it to our tithe and we'll send it on to AICH. You can Venmo us directly to at C-O-V-1-9 dash F-A-R, that's at Cove 19 dash FAR, through 4 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, April 8th. These funds will not go to HowlRound, Howl nor to us personally. They will be added to the pot for our tithe. On the resource site, covid 19 freelanceartistresourcewordpresscom which is C-O-V-I-D 19 F-R-E-E-L-A-N-C-E-A-R-T-I-S-T-E-R-E-S-O-U-R-C-E dot w-o-r-d p-r-e-s-s -S dot c-o-m oh boy you will see a link to the funds raised and who they went to but don't stress if you can't give we're all in this together in addition to our gratitude for all the panelists we'd also like to thank Hal round uh, specifically our colleagues Vijay matthew jd stokely and thea rogers for the vital role they're playing today we are also so grateful to the asl interpreters supporting this call as well as the national captioning institute they're doing the live captioning for the session and before we go any further i'm going to pass it to nicole to lead us in a land acknowledgement thank you so much so as we've gathered digitally, we will be honoring the many indigenous peoples whose land the facilitators and panelists are gathered on. We do this practice as a way of acknowledging the people who were present on Turtle Island as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land. I invite you to breathe as you hear these names. Nicole, calling in from Yamasi and Muskogee lands, also known as Savannah, Georgia. Hannah, calling in from Kickapoo, Kickapoy Lands, and Miami, also known as Central Indiana. Anne Marie Lonsdale, calling from Olone and Chochenyo Land here in Oakland, California. Abigail Vega, calling in from Kwawitekan Lands, now known as San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Rachel Spencer Hewitt, calling in from the land stewarded by the Lenny Lenape people, um, now known as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, Claudia Alec, calling in from uh, the land of the Ohlone people, also recognizing all those who have been displaced and enslaved through colonization. 
Ashley Hansen calling in from Arapaho and Cheyenne land, now known as the Front Range in Colorado, where I'm quarantining with my family. I also want to acknowledge the traditional Dakota homelands of the Wapatin and Wahapukute tribes, now known as Granite Falls, Minnesota, neighboring the Upper Sioux community, where our organization is based. Ani, uh, Cole Elvis calling in from Dish with One Spoon Treaty Territory where the original caretakers include the Mississauga Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat Nations, now known, now known as Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Bonjour. Anin Tindishnikaz calling in from Lenape, Koking, Matahata, where the historically first caretakers of the land, the Lenape peoples, and also the Haudenosaunee, the Canarsie, the Mohegan, the Shinnecock, and out on Long Island, um, many folks who have passed through the waters where the Hudson and the East Rivers meets and a shout out to the Mohawk iron workers so we can cross over from Brooklyn where I'm actually located and um, a big shout out to all the urban native folks who are still here making, creating songs and stories of the First Nations people who. And on behalf of the staff of HowlRound Theater Commons at Emerson College, they wish, wish to respectfully acknowledge that their offices are situated on land stolen from its original holders, the Massachusetts and the Wampanoag people. They wish to pay their respects to those folks, past, present, and future. Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show in Ontario has written this digital land, I'm sorry y'all, <laughs> this digital land acknowledgement, which we wanna share with all of you now. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, um, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leaves significant carbon footprints, contributing to changing climates that are disproportionately affecting indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join me and join us in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization and allyship. Thank you, Abigail. So speaking of technology, when or if, but definitely when the internet connection freezes, we invite you to take a breath and do a body scan and just release those held parts of your body. Or it might be beneficial to reflect on what's been said so far and where those ideas land for you. You are in good company today. We have had thousands of people joining us for these conversations over the past few weeks. And we invite you to, sh to share that you're present with us using the hashtags, hashtag artist resource, hashtag A-R-T-I-S-T-R-E-S-O-U-R-C-E and hashtag HowlRound, hashtag H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D to join the conversation online. How about I unmute myself? There we go. Ah. Anyway, um, that brings us to our reflective five. Um, so the reflective five is the pause for us to check in with ourselves through mindful breathing. This week's reflective five will happen at the top and the bottom of the conversation. And so we'll do one now. Notice some challenges that have been arising for you this week. Inhale, one, two, three, four, five. Hold, five, four, three, two, 
one exhale one two three four five i'm delighted to pass the mic to hannah finland who'll be facilitating today's conversation thank you nicole thank you for your guidance for that moment of pause um, I'm really excited to share the virtual stage with these folks. Um, when we think of our guests today, we think immediately of their visionary leadership, their advocacy, and their depth of lived experience embedded within the communities, within communities that are regularly pushed to the margins in and outside of the culture sector. They have shown over and over what collective action, total access and community care looks like in the arts and culture. And they are not newcomers to the challenges of isolation that we are all facing now. Instead, they have been here ringing the alarm about our field's lack of attention to its people, its creative engines, while simultaneously developing art practices for themselves and their communities that are sustainable, imaginative and flourishing. So we're gonna hear a bit about their stories one by one, and then we're gonna move into a group discussion with some prompt questions from our producing collective and some prompt questions that uh, members of our, our group today have for one another. Uh, but I wanna remind us all that as we listen, uh, this conversation isn't necessarily about replicating these, mokes, these folks' models. Instead, it's about sharing practice to inspire you to find your own solutions. So we, before we move into this sort of one-on-one -on -one moments with each person, um, it is my privilege to welcome for an initial icebreaker, our friends and colleagues, Rachel Spencer Hewitt, Cole Alvis, Claudia Alec, Ashley Hansen, and Ty Defoe to the virtual stage. Hello, friends. Look at them, look at them coming in. Hi. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. So we're gonna take some time and folks have prepared some remarks and we'll talk a little bit about the prompts they're responding to, but just to get us all sort of warmed up um, because it's just continuing to be so weird to not be able to reach out um, and high five you all. Uh, we're gonna start with just, a, just a, a softball one, but depending on your state of mind, depending on where you're at today, it could be harder. Um, and I'm just going to ask each of you to share and we can go perhaps in the order that um, we're, our, we're going to go for our uh, presentations. Share something that you've done today that you're proud of. And I'll invite everyone who's watching right now to think about that too. Maybe take a minute to meditate for yourself. Just one thing that you've done today that you're proud of. Ashley, can I ask you to lead us off? Of course, yes. Uh, so I think, you know, I'm really trying to each day balance community care and self-care. And so um, on the community care side of things, being proud of starting to sift through SBA and CARES Act stuff to try to help help people figure out this whole big clunky system. Um, on the self-care side of things, I had a candlelight breakfast and found it to be really <laughs> a special way to start the day. I highly recommend eating your oatmeal or cereal or granola or whatever you're eating over uh, candlelight. Beautiful. Claudia, can I call you in to share? Indeed, it's a bit early. So the thing I'm most proud of today is that my quinoa bake was a success. Perfect. Cole, what are you proud of today? Ani, everybody, I am proud of uh, signing the petition that I received from our uh, a lovely panelist and, and fellow person here, Ty Defoe. Uh, Land is sacred, stand with the Mushpee Wampanoag tribe. Um, I live in Canada, so my uh, zip code uh, didn't work, um, but uh, hopefully they will accept 90210 and they did. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Cole. And maybe we can get that resource out so folks who are watching today can sign as well. Um, Rachel, what are you proud of today? Uh, I'm proud of today keeping my children alive. Um, I have two of them. And uh, in, in a moment of productivity, when I was tempted to work, I decided to do 20 minutes of stretching instead and use that time to uh, really consciously meditate and embrace the fact that they may walk in on the call today 
And I want to spend my energy and resources on engaging with people and not on erasing that part of my life. And that's an intentional practice. And I'm proud of myself for doing it before noon instead of like afternoon when things have already <laughs> gotten exciting. So um, yeah, just getting your kids through the day is a big, thank you. And we'll await that moment. I think I hear uh, my friends uh, in the background already, Rachel. So we'll wait that moment where we can wave to them. Great. Hi, will you round us out and let us know what is making you proud today? Sure. Yeah, what's making me, I guess, proud today is um, I was able to drink some clean water, uh, noting that's a resource that is still existing um, and just being really grateful for the water that we have. I was able to take a shower and do the things that I need to, you know, to keep it fresh amidst what's happening with COVID, where many others are also fighting that at the same time as this virus. So feeling grateful, I would say. Beautiful. Thank you all. Some really wonderful uh, and deep accomplishments today from the quinoa to the shower, to the petitions, to the CARES Act. Um, so I'm going to transition us into hearing from each of you one at a time, which I'm really, really excited to do. Um, and just to offer that as a producing collective, we asked folks to spend about three or four minutes introducing those who are watching to their work, um, each of the five of you. And we asked them to, one, briefly identify themselves in their work. We asked about some of the strategies, mantras, operating structures, or philosophies that they've deployed in their work, all of these humans, pre the COVID crisis, um, that they've also found useful during this time. Um, and then we've also asked them to talk a little bit about what keeps them motivated, what's giving them hope, uh, and or to what legacies do they attribute their work and their efforts. So we're gonna go in actually the same order, not a mysterious order, just uh, first initial, first name. And we're gonna start with Ashley and then I'll help transition us down the line. So Ashley. Thank you, it is such an honor to be here among heroes and sheroes. And I just um, thank you for inviting, inviting me. Um, I uh, am coming into this conversation with two hats. I, I am the founder and director of the Department of Public Transformation that um, works at the intersection of creativity and civic life in rural communities and a site-specific theater company, Place-Based Productions, telling history stories and imagined futures of rural places through site-specific large-scale musicals. So, um, you know, our work is locational and relational and it uh, centers deep listening to people in their places. And that practice of deep listening continues to be the anchor for our work during this time. And whether it comes in the form of having one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks in our community, just to check in and see how they're doing, or listening to what our regional partners are doing and finding ways for our organization to support or connect the work that's already happening, or providing a platform for rural arts and cultural workers across the country to share ideas with each other. In any of these instances, the practice of deep listening helps inform us where the greatest needs are so we can turn around and be better advocates for our communities and our field. And as an organization that works with rural cultural workers, we have had to be creative about ways to connect across distance for quite some time. So for example, you know, we've been hosting off the clock a monthly digital happy hour for rural arts and cultural workers for the past year. And in general, our work can be quite isolating just based on geography alone. So these happy hours have been an amazing touchstone for folks to stay connected with each other and to the broader conversation around the rural arts movement. And I will say that our last off the clock had the largest attendance as I think and noticed and felt and witnessed our rural leaders really looking for tools and resources that are rural centric right now because our needs are different in a lot of ways from urban spaces. And it's in these moments of connection with other rural practitioners that I'm really finding hope during this time. It's been incredibly inspiring to see the immediate and creative action that our rural collaborators have been taking to connect their people, places, and resources over the past month. I think one of the many benefits of living in a rural place is that in most cases, you know who the vulnerable community members are. You know the best way to contact them, to ask what they need, and you know who to go to to ask for help or support. They are your neighbors, your collaborators, your friends. 
and watching my friends across the country step up and design, implement, and share these really creative community specific solutions to the largest collective challenge of our time has been a great source of motivation and inspiration. And with all of this work, we stand on the shoulders of giants, as they say, and I have the privilege of learning from and working alongside, although at a far geographic distance, but alongside my rural arts and cultural um, colleagues and collaborators on a daily basis. My only hope is that our organization can continue to amplify this work and act as a source of connection with rural people, places, creative solutions, resources in times of crisis or in times of calm. So again, thank you for having me be part of this conversation. Excellent, thank you so much for sharing, Ashley. Claudia, can I invite you to share next? Sure, so I'm the executive producer of a company called Calling Up Justice. It's a transmedia company that's producing performances of justice online, on stage and in real life. I began this company about two and a half years ago and I think of it more as a practice. It's how I live my life and it's me living my dream. Um, current projects include doing consultations, free consultations um, on a weekly basis, um, but long-term projects are doing equity consulting for the Fool's Fury Company and and acting as the guest director for the Fury Factory Festival. I'm co-president of the board of the Network of Ensemble Theaters, so I'm working with a lot of just national movements for funding, as well as just looking at what our field is going to need. I'm advising the National Disability Theater. I advise HowlRound. Um, I'm an advisor for the National Theater Project uh, with the New England Foundation for the Arts. I'm also working with the Doris Duke uh, Foundation um, on a commissioning project. Um, and specifically with Calling Up Justice, we're doing projects like the Every 28 Hours plays. We produced a digital poetry slam with California Shakespeare Theater. We have a project called The Justice Quilt where we have been doing digital story circles for um, over a year. Um, and currently we've got a transmedia Facebook page uh, and we have been doing weekly digital and transmedia producing in an age of pandemic peer exchange sessions online. Um, so when I began this project, uh, two and a half years ago, I first went back to the beginning of my, my practice and I asked myself what was most important to me back in the day. I grew up in a rural area in Montana, so I've always been obsessed with accessing cultural productions across distance. Um, and, my, and I recall being young and frustrated that I couldn't get to the plays. I couldn't get to the video of the plays because technology wasn't there and I couldn't get to New York. Then I moved to New York and I still couldn't get into the theaters because I didn't have enough money to get into the theaters. So then my second obsession was, all right, once you figure out how to uh, share work remotely, how do you also share it um, equitably so everyone can access it? Um, I spent 10 years working at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival where all of my programming was centered on accessibility, uh, physical accessibility, accessibility for all populations, marginalized uh, populations. And also I had an outdoor theater. So I was ideating ways to produce inside of a climate crisis where your outdoor stage might not be accessible to you in unexpected moments. So transmedia producing felt really, really important. Um, I started this project by doing something I called hashtag walkabout, where I called up all of my freelance friends, all of my disabled friends, and all of the people I knew who were digital nomads and a few others to ask them, how do you travel around the country, create a base of operations, but then also how do you function if you're trapped inside your home for possibly a week at a time or 10 days at a time and still remain productive? So my planning has always been one where I plan for the unexpected. Potentially, I will be there physically. Potentially, I will have to um, collaborate digitally and I try to program all of my work around that. Um, um, uh, in this wandering of the country, inspired by invitation, I've been witnessing the intersection of cultural production and social justice, sort of a dramaturgical study of our arts ecology from a non-institutional perspective. And the biggest challenge to social justice outcomes I witnessed was a fundamentally unsustainable and inequitable economic structure. Most of the money's going to rent, it's not going to the artists. Um, and everything seems to be designed to serve the most narrow demographics. So in my practice, I use an intersectional lens. I design for the maximum accessibility and the maximum um, outcomes of justice. I use crypt time. I schedule with intention and balance. 
I do relaxed meetings. You know how you have relaxed theater? I have relaxed meeting style. Um, I create a schedule for myself, but I create a schedule that works for me. So I'm just gonna do a quick vote, uh, quote from Sin's Invalid. This is their skin, tooth and bone. The basis of movement is our people a disability justice primer. And in the 10 principles of disability justice, one of them is recognizing wholeness, valuing people at, as they are, for who they are, and understanding that people have inherent worth outside of capitalist notions of productivity. So my balance is found in family, friends, field service, learning, self-care, ideating about the future, and radical generosity. And I make sure that I have a really rich circle of friends that I can contact over the internet, through a multiplicity of platforms, over the phone, and also in person. And the thing that's keeping me motivated right now is the necessity of this work um, and the amazing human beings who have been working on solving these problems for all of us for many, many years. Um, I didn't make any of this up. I am standing on the shoulders of giants and learning from those who came before me and also learning from people who are doing things every single day. So uh, I shall pass the mic to someone else to continue this conversation. Amazing, thank you, Claudia. And we've tweeted out via the HowlRound Twitter um, at least one of the resources you offered. So thank you so much for that. I see Cole on the screen. Cole, will you take the mic? Ani and um, miigwech. Uh, my name is Cole Alvis. I'm a Machif artist based in Toronto, Canada, uh, which means I have Métis and Chippewa as well as Irish and English heritage that comes from the Turtle Mountains, uh, which is the southern part of Manitoba and the northern part of North Dakota. My artistic process places rigor, equity-seeking values, and community leadership at the center. And through shared leadership platforms, I work with many incredible individuals. Um, the queer theater company I run with Indra Kasapi is called Lemon Tree Creations, um, an indigenous artist run organization called Manadunes Collective. I run with Yolanda Benell and a national art service organization that advocates for indigenous and culturally diverse theater artists called Ad Hoc Assembly. Donna Michelle St. Bernard and I uh, are, are, are at the helm along with, with others and I've been reflecting on a call to action that Alok V. Menon, uh, a genderqueer non-conforming writer and performance artist said on Instagram Live recently, uh, pushing us to be more ambitious with our empathy um, and by practicing intersectionality. Um, prior to, during, and after this pandemic, I think it's, it's essential that we're vigilant as allies to protect everyone in our communities, which, includes recognizing the ways oppressions are compounded and, and often present at, at all times. I think with this time in, in my home that I'm grateful to have on, on these indigenous territories, I'm choosing to find hope in myself and to do what I can to cultivate that in my community, um, that that is an active choice that I can make um, and what I can choose to do with this a privilege that's been afforded to me being born in this body at this time and, and on these lands and waterways. One of the relationships that I'm grateful to be um, continuing uh, to pursue is with a two-spirit artist in the Turtle Mountains on the North Dakota side. This is where my family left um, when their children were taken to a convent um, it's the, the source of the fracture of Indigenous knowledge and language in my maternal line. And uh, recently I've been able to reconnect with uh, a cousin there and I met uh, a two-spirit artist named Awana Gijik, who I feel it's relevant to, to name. Um, and also as we're thinking about ways of, of being, um, the, the, the value and the principle of reciprocity is something that I've been sharing with my auntie and, and anyone else that's coming back with me to, to the Turtle Mountains on the North Dakota side. Um, there's a lot of access that, I, that our family has had um, when they left community and um, uh, moved towards whiteness, marrying white people. And in the case of my parents um, seeking oil in Alberta. And, um, and so it's, it's a conflicted thing for me to um, have the access in class that I do because of those choices, um, but then also see the consequence of that 
on uh, the land and the water. Um, so Gichi Miigwech for, for having me be part of this discussion and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of you. Miigwech. Beautiful, thank you, Cole. Rachel Spencer Hewitt, can I invite you up to the screen? There you are. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, so I am the uh, founder of Parent Artist Advocacy League for the Performing Arts, which goes by PAL, P-A-A-L. It's a national resource hub, solutions generator, and digital and physical community for caregivers in the performing arts and the institutions uh, that support them across the country. Um, PAL has long been advocating like many of the people on this call for so many of the initiatives that have made this time of crisis um, accessible in terms of the way people are connecting with one another. Um, we have long been offering live streaming caregiver support, not only on site, but also sharing digital resources for caregivers. Um, we've been providing free webinars for resource support um, on our Facebook lives and um, also Facebook uh, groups for caregivers in different chapter cities. So we've been using digital resources as ways to connect people who otherwise feel tethered to their physical space because this isn't a new concept. Um, for many people, the difference is just that it's now a global reality. Um, personally, I am an artist. I'm a mother of two, an actor by trade. Um, and my day job is actually digital content creation and management. And I have over five years of experience in developing digital spaces artistically and logistically while solo parenting and homeschooling. And I just wanna uh, give voice and visibility right now that homeschooling is not the same as crisis schooling. And creating a digital space doesn't necessarily mean that you've created an inclusive digital space. And so just to give a voice to those distinctions, which we can talk about a bit more later. Um, and I'm, I'm here to also um, speak to our mission, which is that for parents and caregivers, our caregiving obligations have long shut us out of spaces and shut us in. Um, while, while we're full-time providing for our families and caring for our children, trying to find space to breathe and create and negotiate supportive work policies, and the obligations have long been on us to advocate for ourselves and we've been pushed off as a niche group or um, here's your affinity group that you can meet with at lunch when now that it's a universal reality and we all need it, people seem more ready for the conversation. Um, I've been reflecting on my personal experiences with those um, and there are five principles that I think that uh, everyone can take away and apply not only to our lives now, but in how we rebuild our systems and our structures. And that's first starts with a mindset shift, which is that everyone is vulnerable. Um, we may be vulnerable at different times, but it's going to take empathy when we are when we all are able to go out again or feel healthy again to remember that crisis happens all the time to individuals. It's just unique now because it's happening globally and we can't forget that support is always necessary. Um, two, work from home policies are possible for every organization. Supportive scheduling to reduce burnout and financial burdens because access to digital spaces is also a class reality and an economic reality. Do you have the equipment? Do you have Wi-Fi? How else are we supporting people financially? Um, and we also need to shape the space and caregiving support for funds. Um, I would say that I want to acknowledge the women of color and the leaders of color who have long advocated for caregiver supportive practices. And um, I'm gonna quote Delicia Turner Sonnenberg from Moxie Theater Company. Um, she used the term self generosity uh, in a webinar that we did on the Facebook live page yesterday. Um, and also Kaya Dunn, who is a, a teacher at um, UNC. And she was talking about how we can let go of this need to produce and be active at this time. And I just want to reflect on that, that as we share these resources, is to give us all space to breathe. Mm, that's gorgeous, Rachel. Thank you. Ty, will you close us out by sharing your responses to these prompts? I hear you, Ty. All right. <laughs> so this is Ty. You can see my name and I'm going to start my video now. Hello, everyone. Boujou, Ty again. Um, just wanted to talk a little bit about some of these prompts and wanted to say my artistic process aspires to interweave social justice, ingenuity, 
um, indigiqueering and environmentalism by all means possible in this global pandemic because um, more and more people are beginning to understand um, what this is and also relate to the arts and the interconnectedness of all living things. And I think the one thing that stands out to me in terms of thinking about this from verbalizing it is um, talking about the great hoop or the great circle of life, um, noting that all things are, are connected, that there isn't um, a hierarchy when there is uh, shared leadership. And we can talk more about that if you're interested. But this is something that, uh, you know, I, I'm drawing upon elders and ancestors and also um, some other folks within the Native Indigenous community. And like I said, I'm here in New York City, um, you know, doing lots of work with the American Indian Community House, um, as well as Native folks across Turtle Island. And I wanted to do this quote from um, Delena Studi, who is the co-artistic director at Native Voices. Um, she said that never waste a crisis. And she starts this off when we are part of our virtual talking circles hosted by Haskell Indian Nations University in Kansas. Um, and this is a place where uh, intergenerational folks are able to come and connect and so what I'm finding during this time is a cultural resurgence of people um, calling upon uh, the conversation and to create story dialogue by any means possible. Um, I've also noted some things that I've been seeing and participating in, such as the social distancing powwow on Facebook across the country. And this is um, where social gatherings weren't able, able to happen in the United States, you know, from like 1978 and below that. So now it's a, it's a good time. People are sh dusting off their regalia, getting those songs started and creating art, um, which is great, finding another way to connect. Um, there's also folks who have been going on into learning language learning classes, and this is something that I've been participating in too. So it's really great to have, uh, you know, the resource of the, the interwebs, the internet, to connect with people and to check on people back home. Um, one thing that has been most special during this time, I think, as an artist, in terms of finding that connection, has been meeting with the elder brunch that happens Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 12 rain or shine here on zoom and it's a time to just listen and show up for elders to see what is needed uh, in their homes as they are you know going through a lot um as well you know a lot of the indigenous elders um another thing i think that um i've been trying to you know in terms of bringing some of these philosophies into fruition is the, you know, the, as Cole mentioned earlier, the Wampanoag Nation and the Mashpee um, got their tribal um, government, their, their tribal sovereignty status revoked. And so there's this huge petition going on right now with folks signing it. Um, so that just brings me to the point of that this conversation, yes, COVID is happening, we all must take care, but it's also a yes and conversation. It's a yes and, and I feel like consistently for so long, um, you know, queer folks, marginalized folks, um, indigenous folks have been doing this yes and conversation. So I'm also interested in the philosophy of opening up that circle a bit more um, with the arts and and the world, the everyday happening and how to connect. So I'm doing a lot of arts at this time and in, in interweaving and interconnecting as it relates to anchoring in values. And some of those values are to honor and to celebrate, to decolonize and indigenize time, space and resources in all stages of practicing, to um, expose and dismantle any kind of uh, bigotry or biases or disrespect and uh, opportunity to create new practices and accountability being viable. How do we retain the accountability over the socials? Um, and just want to give a little plug here if you're interested in the art showing April 10th and 11th with all my relations collective where some of these values were implemented, we're going to do um, an excerpt of Gisha Bagizig, um, which is revolving sky for folks to promote some good medicine out there. Um, it talks about star knowledge, indigenous queerness and connecting together so that we can all I've been reading this book in the morning too have some radical hope for this time.
Um, and I'll leave it there so we can get to the discussion. Please reach out. Y'all have my information. I am so open to Zoom, talk, text, chat about what's going on, but also how do we uphold and take care of the, you know, the sacred circle of all living things, the two-legged, the four-legged, the winged, and the rooted uh, during this time. Thank you, Ty. And thank you, everyone. I'm going to invite you back in with your videos. Um, and also just acknowledge that our producing team has been putting out links to pretty much all of the resources and organizations and collectives that you all are either a part of or referenced. So if you're interested, again, in all of the magnificent work that these folks are referencing, you can find it on HowlRound's Twitter feed. So please do go there and we'll keep doing that throughout the call. Um, so. Whew, that was a lot of beautiful information. And I thank you for putting that out into the atmosphere. It's a, you know, something that I feel like folks can go back to and, and watch the recording and, and, and deepen into. Um, but I do want to take some time to lead us through a little bit more crosstalk. Um, and I've just a few questions for you folks and we can sort of popcorn them. Um, and this one, I think hopefully just Diving in, going straight to the heart. Um, I've been reading, as all of us have, um, a lot of folks' different experiences of this moment of this crisis. Um, I read a quote on body worker Susan Raffo's blog uh, recently, and Susan wrote, I keep being struck by how the things we should be doing in response to the coronavirus are really the things we should be doing as a way of being alive. How if it does, does this resonate with y'all? How does it apply to your experience of individual and collective survival and how you are sort of mediating and supporting and investing in that for your work? And I'm gonna, anybody who wants to jump in is free to jump in. Um, I, when I read that quote and thank you for sharing it, for me, what's what keeps coming up is how universally in this moment, we're all being asked to say yes to the reality of being human. Um, this, this idea of how, you know, this, this virus makes no discrimination, that uh, it takes a collective act for us to feel strength and for us to seek health and to improve. Um, all of these conversations in terms of sick leave, caregiver support, lack of child care, um, crisis at home, um, the domestic disputes. It, these are all realities that I feel when we allow ourselves to believe the illusion of um, everything is fine, uh, workplace policies that are based on a best case scenario, um, we are absolutely rejecting the reality of what we are which are vulnerable, dynamic human beings. And this time is asking us to say yes to that vulnerability, to the fact that we are mortal and, um, and the fact that we are responsible not just for our own health, but for each other's health. Like this is not a solo operation. We are not asked to engage in this life for this like individualistic bootstrap my success idea, but that success is, is, a, is a collective effort. How do we flatten the curve for the world? How do we engage in best practices to support everyone, to center the vulnerable, the elderly, the people who are immunocompromised is such a lesson in centering our practice on the people with the greatest need as opposed to the people with the least need and then building support for people with needs after the fact. Um, that it's not a, an afterthought, but it's our priority. I think that that should always be the case of how we build structures and, and, and go about how we think about engaging with people. Hello, this is Claudia. So I've been feeling uh, this strange mix of deep, deep cynicism and deep, deep hope in this moment. Because in crisis, there is opportunity. There's the opportunity for transformation and the opportunity for further exploitation. Um, as I was wandering the country and kind of assessing what I thought was wrong with the American theater scene, my, my biggest reason for not publishing most of my findings was I didn't have a good replacement. I didn't have a good answer 
because most of our structures were designed to maintain themselves, to maintain themselves despite the people inside of them saying, this doesn't work for any of us. So in this moment of everything breaking, I go, okay, can, can we acknowledge that the way we were doing it was bad? And can we do things a different way now? Yeah, I'm all for uh, different models and um, being inspired to make change. And I'm conscious of how the virus doesn't discriminate, but that the structures and the systemic nature of how things have been certainly does. And I'm, I'm thinking again about Juana Gizek, the two-spirit artist that I referenced, who participated in, uh, as a water protector, the uh, Turtle Mountain uh, Chippewas were one of the first to ban fracking in, in the Turtle Mountains. And of course, that's a significant way that the oil industry continues to, to find uh, profit. And, um, and then when I consider the poverty that Awana Gijik lives in, it's, it's stark for me, this inequity that uh, is normalized. And um, uh, not only that it's inequitable, but, but that one must be in relationship with the land in a productive way or in an exploitative way. And that that is being normalized is, um, is just really shocking um, and unfortunate to me. Um, and so if we could look at this as an opportunity to make change, uh, yes, please. Hey, this is Ty. I'm gonna say yes, yes, and yes to all the things that you said, Claudia and Cole and Rachel. And, um, you know, I was thinking ab ab about this too and about the system and access. So I'm gonna yes, Anja too, about the idea that some of these um, coming together and the connection and the system being broken, all those things. I feel like there are, you know, when I'm also finding out on these conversations with elders, it's like, wow, sometimes for the first time, folks are clearing their schedule, right? Saturday and Sunday mornings to sit down and listen to the wisdom that elders who have had this like vast experience and lived much longer on this earth, they have, you know, there are things that they say, like live carefully, what you do will come back to you, accept what life brings, you cannot control many things, honor your elders, they will show you the way in life. And a lot of these sort of, I guess like indigene things across many nations across Turtle Island have been shared. And I feel like um, it was interesting. One elder was like, wow, I feel like I haven't been asked what I need for several years. And here it was like a Zoom call of, you know, about a dozen sort of in between ages who are asking this because of this pandemic. And it was turning something and making something into a gift so that we could move forward as a means for perseverance and survival. And um, also wanted to underscore the additional laughter being medicine and the cynicism um, from folks who have had such passed down historical trauma has been really healing at this time as well. Yes, yes, yes to everything my friends have said and the yes and in honoring Thai, which you said before, um, in our rural communities and in Indian country, a lot of this uh, is not new. We're acutely aware of the limitations of our healthcare, education, child care system, and have been advocating for access to broadband and healthy food options for a really long time. And it has definitely been amplified during this time, but um, it's something that we know really deeply and um, I hope, I hope that this is an opportunity for our statewide, our national, our tribal leaders, our pub general public to have a better understanding of the geographic inequities that have existed for some time so we can continue to um, push those agendas forward and provide more access. Um, my optimistic side, uh, it, building on Claudia's feeling complex during this time, you know, I said, I hope that this gives our country the opportunity to hear the song that the rural folk have been singing for a long time and hopefully build empathy and complexifying our understanding of rural challenges and finding opportunities where rural and urban neighbors can learn from each other, um, where we can find moments of urban rural solidarity. Um, but my pessimistic side is worried about how this challenge will widen, not lessen the perceived rural urban divide. And I hear folks in, in my region say things like, um, of course, we, we can't get tested out here. 
there's like this assumption that we're lesser than and undeserving of equal access to healthcare, and it's just like a known thing because of our zip code. And that sentiment is really um, real and really hard to overcome. And um, I hope that this opens the ears to that call that's been being made for a long time. Uh, this is Claudia and the concerns of our rural com uh, community. I feel like I'm hearing that echoed in most of the communities that I belong to. So that's being echoed really loudly with the disabled community all over the country in both urban and rural areas. The disabled community, A, are the, the ways of surviving in the world that we had already designed. Those are the ways everybody is surviving in the world right now and they are straining the way that we have been surviving. So, so it's already impacting the disabled community. I know when I've been chatting with friends from uh, the black community, most of us um, are deeply aware that black people are dying more. Black people are dying more in the United States and that should not, there's no good reason for that in terms of science. Um, that's 100% behavior and the way our country works. You know, I think it's real interesting that some folks thought that they could poison our systems and they would have no negative impact. It's all connected. I guess that's the lesson we're learning. We're all connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, folks. Um, and I, I, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the depth of experience and just the examples that you all are offering into this conversation um, is, you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to bring you together. And so, you know, to, to kind of angle into that a little bit more deeply, this idea of, of social or probably more aptly put physical distancing um, is something that due to a variety of circumstances, each of you has had some familiarity with, some relationship to um, the communities you work within and belong to. Um, so, you know, while many of us have been scrambling for meaning and experiencing a new version of what it means to be quote unquote alone, um, what we've seen and what we've heard over the last 40 minutes are, you know, uh, calls to action, are deep and thoughtful resources and a general sense of, you know, we may not know everything that's going on, but we got you. We have responses in this moment. So, I would love to hear you all each speak a little bit about what leadership means to you. Um, and, you know, that's what that's we're putting you here because we are looking to you as sort of leaders in this moment, folks who may not have all the answers, but do have a breadth of experience um, from which we can um, or which we can follow. Um, so speaking a little bit about what leadership means in this moment. And then I'm also curious, you know, there's a lot being asked of leaders in this moment. So what do you feel like you can give and offer to others and what are your personal systems for preserving some some of that for yourself um what are you sort of holding back to make sure that you're keeping yourselves healthy and whole yeah anybody can start <laughs> I'll hop in here. Um, so uh, thinking about that physical distance and geographic isolation, which has been a reality for rural cultural workers for a long time. So we have a lot of creative strategies for staying connected and that I think are you know beneficial all of the time, not just now. Uh, we recognize that in, or, in addition to being, you know, stepping up and being community organizers uh, and, and really helping you know, on the ground and in community work, uh, rural artists are often the ones to also bring bold vision and hope and joy to their communities. So we invited our collaborators across the country to contribute to a list of ideas for creative, compassionate, and joyful connections during social distancing, um, stuff that people have been doing, you know, already for a long time, but um, wanting to share that as a, as a resource. And uh, also just seeing rural leaders really step up and create space for conversation and connection um, for people to, to our, people to articulate their needs and really identify what collective resources already exist. Um, and how we can help meet one another's needs. Like uh, there's uh, um, examples of you know, community websites being created, Mary Welcome in Palouse, Washington, Blue Sky Center in New Cayuma, uh, California, um, Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Um, there's some really incredible successful examples of immediate creative community organizing being led by artists and connecting, um, connecting the most vulnerable community members to the resources. And, that kind of um, echoing what Rachel had said earlier, that tangible awareness of how our actions 
are affecting others, um, wouldn't it be great if that was how we operated all the time? And I, I really do see um, there being an opportunity to learn from um, some of our, our, our rural uh, colleagues about the way in which they center vulnerable community members all of the time. So I would say look to your rural leaders in this moment. Uh, hey, this is Ty. Hope you can hear me here. Um, I wanted to say that some things that, you know, I've been finding most useful as a creative artist and connecting it all together, since that seems to be the running thread and theme too, is participating in artistic jams, um, you know, that are like facilitated by um, folks that want to also practice leadership, which has been so wonderful getting um, in the minds and the opportunity to collaborate in that kind of way with the next generation of artists that are coming up as well as, you know, elders who um, also at that time who want to still participate in creative art making, which has been great. I'm also made aware that, um, you know, time is one of the biggest colonizers, right? And I often talk with Lori Woolery about this, about, about partnering with time and the idea how can we partner with time to um, create a type of risk and resilience as it relates to creative art making. And um, through some of that work with all my relations, we have found um, really like you all do here, taking those five breaths before starting meetings and throughout the, the process, because we ain't going anywhere. We cannot go outside right now. We can't do things. So, you know, take the time needed to actually um, form the reciprocal relationship, as Cole was mentioning, um, that I think is really, really uh, important to do. Like we have the time. So gift that to ourselves as makers and artists. Uh, this is Claudia. I invested in my space. So my space is full of the comfy blankets and the beautiful artwork and all of the things that bring me joy. I can't turn in a direction without seeing something or being able to reach for something that sparks joy in my life. I made sure that my home does that for me. I got plants to take care of. There are things that are alive that depend on me. I love taking care of those plants. I already had a practice of doing digital brunches with folks. So I'm still doing my digital brunches where we meet on my Zoom and we have coffee and breakfasts and whatnot over the computer. We're doing that. <laughs> Um, I have a weekly meditation practice, and so I've been inviting people to do silent meditations with me online. That's been lovely. Um, and of course, epic, epic text message uh, threads with my family. Memes are life. <laughs> so that's self-care for Claudia. I want to interject here and say um, the text message thing. So I was listening to an interview with George Saunders and Cheryl Strayed the other day and the uncertainty of this moment and all that one of the things that we can best do is be sensorily aware of the things that are happening by documenting them because we may not actually know what will be important to this moment until later. And we may be able to see those threads when we look back later, if we've properly documented what we were thinking and feeling. And so that keeping the text message threads and, and making sure that there's a documentation of what, what we were experiencing feels really um, resonant and relevant to me right now. Um, Cole and Rachel, do you wanna share around this question of, of leadership and, and also taking care of yourself as you give? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm um, definitely resonating with the opportunity to um, be present at home with the way that I make this my space and uh, whether that's picking up a knitting project or um, a book that I've been meaning to get to, um, doing some thinking about what is the foundation uh, that um, I often uh, prior to this pandemic was launching from or um, operating more often outside of and um, is there an opportunity to really invest in who I am here to, um, to make me stronger in the world? And um, definitely the, the connection with family and, and friends where often a lot of uh, my work is now happening over Zoom, but friends and family are also <laughs> uh, discovering, uh, discovering Zoom. So it's, it's a lot of this <laughs> and that has its own uh, a level of exhaustion. So definitely limiting screen time is, is, is a useful practice. Um, and then also um, 
confronting some of the 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 conversations that uh, maybe I have not been choosing to have with with my family around identity and um, around what it means to um, be my full self and that's ongoing work and and challenging in and of itself but um, is definitely present for me in this time. Um, yeah, for for me, this has been um, an opportunity to engage with leadership, to ask questions that can't be avoided by going into an office or going into a space that is um, absent of children or dependents. Because when you're zooming into people's homes, you will you will see it. The, the children will crawl on you. They're being surprisingly great right now, but that's because my partner is on nights and he just woke up and he's taking care of them. So it actually might. Um, so happened that they don't join this Zoom call, which would be rare. Um, but I think uh, the questions that I would offer leadership to be asking at this time is where is the financial disparity in my community? Um, when we asked that question uh, for PAL, we said, where's the financial disparity in our community? And um, we've started the PAL COVID Emergency Relief Fund for Artists with Families because as people are getting laid off and as productions are closing and as unemployment is becoming more and more difficult to apply for, these individuals are not just buying groceries for one, they're buying groceries for four or five. And there is no no daycare, there is no school, there is no caregiver. Um, it's an opera last year in 2019, my most expensive month for childcare was uh, emotional creature. Um, <clears throat> was uh, Women's International um, History Month because of all the gender parity events I had to attend <laughs> for equity. And um, I spent hundreds of dollars on childcare just to show up. And it was, it was too much. Um, the rest of my year was uh, completely altered by that because of the inequity in the fight for equity. And so what I would encourage is at this time as we're planning our 2020 to say, where is that financial disparity? How expensive is my free event for people who have to pay for childcare? How expensive is my free streaming event for people who need networking opportunities but can't access my space? How can I create conversation once I'm able to get back into the office but other people still can't? Um, so that's the question I would offer leaders to ask, where is the financial disparity in my community? And then, um, for immediacy right now as an individual, the power that you that you have <clears throat> is to remember that caregivers can't zoom out. So when they are not on calls, they're being touched and needed and, um, and whether it's an elder dependent or whether it's a child, they're on the clock 24 seven engaging. There is no such thing as a checkout, especially now that people are sheltered. So um, ways that you can take care is to offer to Venmo a little bit for groceries or um, offer to do a virtual call with their children or with their elder dependents so that they can step away and um, read a book or do the work or file for unemployment and do a call while you're reading a book to their children online. Um, the, this idea of it takes a village is something that I got frustrated hearing when I had my first and then my second because I was like it always takes a village why are you telling that to me now because now you're so out of practice being my village that the learning curve is too steep so now we're getting a crash course in being a village I would just engage that like as leadership we can say okay how can we continue to be a village from this point point? and in terms of self-care I think for for myself and for parents like be really explicit with those boundaries on other people and say I am not meeting with you before noon. I'm not Zooming with you before noon because that is time that I need to care for my full-time work here in my home and here in my space and know that you are the expert of your home. That was something else that Delisa Turner Sundenberg offered. You are the expert at this time with what your ecosystem needs. And so by giving yourself that agency and that power, you can remove that burden from having to fulfill everyone else's expectations, like full permission to let go what the teachers and the bosses and everyone is telling you, you should be doing to produce at this time. That's, yeah, that's that. Rachel, thank you. I wish we were in the same space. 
where hearts are beating together. Um, you all, I want to acknowledge that we were technically supposed to stop at three, and I feel like there's a little bit more I want to dig into, and also to recognize uh, Ty's expression of partnering with time, um, and Claudia just brought up something really important, which is that, do you want to say it, Claudia? <laughs> I was just joking, but it's real. It's real. Our relationship with time is messed up. Time didn't do nothing to you. Time's all right. Time is fine. In fact, what we need to do is get a different relationship of time that isn't being controlled by white heterosexual patriarchal capitalism and white supremacy. But time didn't do nothing. I'm okay with time. So let's flex. I'm down for whatever. I love it. I love it. And as we create our village, as some of us are creating our villages for the first time, we are, are going to be flexed for just a moment because I want to, um, there was another question we wanted to ask, but I, but I, we had a question that Ashley wanted to ask actually other, the rest of the group, um, which seems like a really beautiful way to end actually. Um, and so that's why I wanted to invite you to bring that in Ashley. And then, you know, there's, a, there's quite a bit of other stuff that was sort of rolling around in all of our heads that we'll try to share. And maybe, maybe we can post about it. Maybe we can, um, you all can, we can share some writing after the fact, but Ashley, do you want to jump in with that question? Yeah, I mean, just hearing all of the amazing work that you all are doing, um, you know, as leaders, we often work towards collective action and we, we move quickly, we, we act. And uh, this is really a time for collective reflection. So my question is, as kind of a takeaway for uh, the people participating in this call, what do you hope folks spend, are spending time reflecting on during this time in, in our, of our collective reflection? I hope we're reflecting on how much of our systems and, and our maybe our own expectations of ourselves are aiming for a goal of success as opposed to a source point of compassion. Like how can we start to flip that like as a daily practice of compassion for ourselves? I love that Rachel and it's a part of the practice within the, the theater work that I do, how can we tell stories and cause the least amount of harm? And I'm, I'm thinking of that as moving forward and then in, in this period, also reflecting on um, some discordance with, with my family, what does it mean or how can we create platforms where people can disagree? Um, I think it does a real disservice when um, folks suggest to not talk about politics or religion or whatever it is um, at, at the kitchen table because that means we aren't um, practicing how to be in the room with each other and how to manage that discordant um, and find consent consensus. Um, so yeah, I get you me gretch for that. their reflections on reflecting? Uh, I have been doing a lot of writing recently on what I call the white imagination and the limitations of the white imagination and the places in myself where I felt like I was failing to be able to imagine solutions because I was trapped inside this white imagination. So I'm hoping everybody is just bouncing up against the walls of the white imagination and the patriarchal imagination and the capitalist imagination and finding some liberatory ideas to do something different. Thank you. Wow. I love that movement in there, Claudia. That was like in Zoom. I'm like, I need to move. So <laughs> in my reflection, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm reflecting on reflecting, but I get to like also think about, you know, things like magic, which is like, whoa, here's a like queer indigenous person gets to think about magic because I have like the time to do so, <laughs> and, like, um, which is fantastic. Uh, in between things. So um, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone and also how to change my background on Zoom too, which, you know, oftentimes in meetings I don't get to, but now is sort of also like socially acceptable to do. So I've often been doing that and teaching people how to do it because it's so fun to also bring people to a different visual world, which is also very a uh, theatrical experience. <laughs> 
Beautiful. I love these backgrounds. Oh, you all, this is um, really fantastic. Um, I know we're going to breathe in and out in just a moment with Nicole, but um, you know, to close us out, I, I just want to actually offer one more quote um, from a hero of mine, hero writer of mine, Rebecca Solnit, um, who wrote recently an opinion piece in the New York Times about what we're all facing. And I think, you know, I was like reading it and I was like, oh, it's so interesting. It sort of goes with, and then you all, just the, the brilliance that you have um, offered us throughout this call has really made me feel like I just want to put it out into the world to close us. Um, Rebecca wrote, but like so many other disasters, this one has revealed how interconnected we are, how much we depend on the labor and goodwill of others, how deeply en enmeshed we are in social, ecological and economic systems and how prevention or survival of something as deeply, boldly, bodily personal as a disease depends on our collective decisions and those of our leadership. And in our cultural field, in our field of cultural producers, you folks are our leadership. So thank you for shining a beacon for all of us. Um, and thank you for being with us today. Um, and we're gonna offer, the producers are gonna offer a little closing, but just our deepest gratitude to you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. These conversations are so incredible. Uh, I always come with my tissues and my hydration of water. Um, so thank you. Banana. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So as we move into um, taking this conversation deeper within ourselves, whoopsie. <laughs> um, this last reflective five is around, um, can you think about an artist who has a strong community practice that inspires you, right? I know I just got to sit on this webinar with um, you know, these amazing folks. And so I hold you all as I do my reflective fives. So we inhale, one, two, three, four, five, hold, five, four, three, two, one, exhale, one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. So before we completely close out, we want to offer an exercise. Thinking about today, what are three things that you want to explore more? Artists you learned about, tools, websites, articles, books, podcasts, past projects that you want to come back to. And we invite you to commit to learning more and exploring how you can apply these concepts of connectivity, tools for connections across physical boundaries and authentic community building to your practice as an artist. So write down three things that come to mind right now and take some time maybe 30 or 45 minutes later today or during the week to check them out online or on social media, do that research. We really invite you to take some time to move into a space of curiosity and learning. And I've learned that when I write things down, I'm more likely to follow through. Awesome. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being with us today. So I just want to give a round of applause to all of our panelists. Thank you for being here. <laughs> um, so the recording of this conversation is going to be available within 24 hours on howlround.com. And our first sessions, which include topics including emergency funding, legal support, national advocacy, financial strategies for individual artists, and reimagining how we gather are already on HowlAround.com. If you learned something from this conversation today, spread the word and spread the link. We always uh, welcome feedback 
and suggestions for next, next week's tithe donation. So if you have some, please send them to us at artistresource at howlround.com. A-R-T-I-S-T-R-E-S-O-U-R-C-E at H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D dot C-O-M. And on that note, we have a correction from our second webinar with Amy Smith, which was focused on financial strategies for freelance artists. Because that took place before the CARES Act was passed, uh, we wanted to offer this update, which is that as per the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, a single member LLC may apply for the SBA Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP. Applications for self-employed individuals will begin this Friday, April 10th, 2020. Information was developing quickly at that time, and we are doing our best to keep up. So when that webinar was recorded, that information was not yet available. So we encourage you to contact your bank um, and look for that resource through your existing banking relationship or Google SBA approved bank and see if you can find a loan servicer who could work with you. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, so we'll be continuing these conversations every Tuesday on HowlRound TV at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Uh, Central, 12 p.m. Mountain Time, and 11 a.m. Pacific. Join us next Tuesday, April 14th, for a conversation attending to our spirits. All of these conversations are attending to our spirits, but yes, uh, healing and enduring time at this, uh, during this traumatic time. I'm sorry, my screen is jumping, folks, so it's a little hard for me to read, so thank you for your patience. We'll be announcing more Tuesday conversations soon, and we hope you'll join us. We also want to lift up our, yes, our incredible partner, HowlRound. They provided us with the platform and technology funds for the ASL interpreters and captioners, as well as some support for our panelists today. Awesome. And before we go, we want to see the commons in action. We've talked about the commons a lot. Um, if you've got something out of today's conversation, uh, I know I did, we want to ask that you direct that love and support towards the American Indian Community House in New York City, which is where our donation today is going. Um, you can use the Venmo, which is our Venmo we set up once a week just for this, which is cov 19 far as in freelance artist resources, um, to give any amount, a dollar or three. Uh, let's see how abundant we can be. Um, we as a collective will be donating $750 to uh, the, the community house and we're challenging our community who are tuning into this call to help make it a thousand. So if you can help us, we'd be much, appreci much appreciative. We'd be very grateful. If that's what we would be very grateful. <laughs> Friends, let's take care of each other. Keep connecting. Uh, and for more resources added every day, visit the WordPress resource site, COVID-19 Freelance Artist Resource .wordpress.com. And we encourage you to join HowlRound's mailing list to be advised of future conversations. Thank you so much to Rachel Spencer Hewitt, Claudia Alec, Ashley Hansen, Cole Alvis, and Ty Defoe. And thank you for spending you. time with us together today. Take care and we will talk next Tuesday. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having us on. Thank you. Appreciate you all. Hello? Am I, is this thing still on? Oh. I guess donate. If you care, you'll donate. Love you all. Take good care. Oh, I'm supposed to not be talking. <laughs>